right. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This is Down to the Last Detail, how downtowns use Van Wango technology. We are joined today by some lovely guests. Um, while everyone's still kind of joining in, I'll just give a quick overview of um, Van Wango. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the technology, Van Wango is a travel technology company that works to connect communities to their local businesses. So a lot of our clients are destination marketers. We work with several trade associations, chambers of commerce, um, and downtown associations, which you guys will hear a little bit more about today. Van Wango's technology is um, featured on passports that look and feel like an app, but don't have to be downloaded or deleted from anyone's phones. We help our clients connect all of their things to do into those easy to use mobile passports so that they're able to deliver to consumers experiences like tasting passes, check-in challenges, savings passes and event passports. So you'll hear a little bit more about all of those today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself and then I'll introduce our wonderful clients. My name is Emily Harris and I'm the Director of Marketing Operations here at Van Wango. I work with clients as they launch their passports along with um, our lovely marketing team um, to make sure that they launch their passports and market them in ways that are going to maximize their outreach and make the most of their money and time. So um, that's what I do. And I'm here to share with you guys some really cool use cases. Um, I'm joined today by Lori Foster. Lori, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? You bet. Thanks, Emily. I'm Lori Foster, Chief Strategy Officer with Downtown Tempe Authority, Tempe, Arizona. Awesome. And then we're also joined by Katie Houston. Katie, do you want to give yourself a little intro? Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm Katie Houston. I'm with the Downtown Partnership of Colorado Springs in Colorado, and I'm the marketing specialist. Awesome. And then last but not least, we're joined by Colin from Longmont. Colin, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me as well. Um, good to see everybody. Um, I'm Colin Argus. I am the marketing and events specialist with the Longmont Downtown Development Authority in Longmont, Colorado. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, so for everyone tuning in, what we're going to do is Lori, Katie and Colin are going to tell you a little bit about the passports that they launch with Van Wango and share some really cool and creative ideas. And then we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A at the end where we talk about um, how Van Wango works and how Lori, Katie and Colin have used it in the past, learned lessons along the way. We're also gonna talk a little bit about how downtown associations um, like our three clients here, work with their community partners and engage their merchants to really maximize the benefits that all of those people see in being part of their organization. So some really good um, conversation happening today and hopefully everyone leaves this with um, some really awesome ideas. Everyone can find this webinar after the fact, share it with your friends, um, on bandwango.com in our resources section. Also, anyone who is attending today will receive a link to the video afterwards via email. So be on the lookout for that and share with your friends by pointing them to bandwango.com in the resources section. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna go ahead and kick our slides off. Lori is gonna be our first presenter here. So Lori, if you wanna take over and tell us a little bit about your passport, that would be wonderful. Great, thanks, Emily. Um, well, first, um, introduce myself. I'm Chief Strategy Officer, and I work a lot with our stakeholders, whether it's the merchants, the office dwellers, visitors, residents. We have a lot of students uh, and a major university in our downtown. And, we are always focusing on ways to keep our city fun. We're an entertainment district with a lively um, bar and restaurant scene. And so we're always looking for ways to engage our stakeholders and keep it fun. So I have a little quote there. Will the city be any fun? We always try to answer that with a big yes. So 
who are we? I wanted to give you a little idea of where we are. We're in Phoenix, Arizona in the Valley of the Sun. And Tempe is nestled between Phoenix, Mesa and Chandler. And our downtown is a small one. It's about a half square mile at the north end of Tempe. So we're that little blue box there. And we started using Bandwango. Um, we're very new. We've just launched our first pass. And we started to use Bandwango because we were looking for ways that are fun to invite people downtown to discover downtown Tempe, to rediscover downtown Tempe, find new things about a city that maybe they haven't known before, and a way to support the merchants. So we were looking for something that did something for everyone, which is almost impossible to find. We were really focused on, obviously, pandemic recovery, finding something that would help us during our low seasons, which here in Arizona are the hot summer times. And in Tempe, um, December is really slow for us. We have a major university, uh, Arizona State University, right in our downtown. So we're very seasonal in terms of the city um, population with students, faculty, and staff. We're also looking for something to engage the many visitors that we have to our downtown and the conferences that um, we've had in the past and hopefully will return. Um, we've got some conferences coming up this fall, so we're extremely hopeful. We're looking for a way to engage all the residents in Tempe, as well as ASU students and all of the suburban Tempeans that live south of downtown and bring them back to downtown to discover their city. So we chose Banwango because number one, it wasn't an app. There's not, there's not an app to download. So we wanted it to be super easy for the, for the user. And we set our pass up as, and originally we intended it to be just a check-in pass. We didn't think our merchants would be open to doing a lot of discounting just coming out of the pandemic, but Luckily, the majority of merchants, um, given the option to offer a special discount, did offer a special discount. So we're kind of a hybrid. We're both a check-in and a savings pass. Uh, for the check-in, we are requiring that um, people put a pin in so that we can report, report back to the merchants how many people are coming to them as a result of this pass, because we're all about data and showing that return on our investment. Um, so our target market, let me find the right button here. Our target market for this pass were um, several residents. Our development in our downtown has been crazy even during the pandemic. We've been growing by leaps and bounds. We have over 3,000 residents in our small downtown district. We also have a lot of visitors that come through downtown. Traditionally, we have a lot of events in downtown Tempe and they are making a comeback this fall. So we have Ironman Arizona, we have a huge Oktoberfest, we have spring training in the spring for Major League Baseball. We're right in the center of about 15 um, teams that uh, train around the valley. And um, ASU students, we have 14,000 ASU students that live on campus in our downtown. And so we wanted a way to engage students to come into our downtown and explore everything that is available for them. And of course, I mentioned the suburban Tempians. We wanted to bring people from the southern suburbs up into downtown to rediscover their city. So we had some goals that we set and we basically just kind of looked to see what was happening with other uh, passes around the, the country that are being used by DMOs and kind of took an average of some of their goals and we discovered uh, or we determined our goals. And so, in the first 30 days, we want 300 signups for our Discover Pass. In six months, we want 1,900 signups and about 4,000 signups in 12 months. Um, and then we'd like a, about a 65% conversion rate. And so of those 300 signups in the first 30 days, we want 204 check-ins or redemptions, a little over 1,200 in six months and uh, 4,000 in 12 months. So um, I'm happy to say we actually launched our Discover Downtown Tempe Pass seven days ago. So last Tuesday, we launched our pass. And as of this morning, we have 244 check-ins with about a 10% redemption rate at this point. So we're pretty excited about that. 
Um, for our merchants, we I was pretty scientific about how we invited our merchants to be a part of this pass. Number one, I wanted to create a really unique and fun experience for the pass holder. Number two, I wanted to have some merchants that you can't find anywhere else in the valley. We have a lot of downtowns in the valley, so I wanted a unique experience, uh, unique to Tempe. And I also wanted to work with good operators, so merchants that have their act together and can um, play well in the sandbox, as it were. And so at this point, we have about 28. We launched our pass with 30 check-ins, 28 of which are merchants. Uh, majority are offering a discount. And then we have two locations. One is a public art scavenger hunt. Another is a great selfie station mural that we have downtown. And we intend on offering um, some other attractions as well. So it won't be just merchant based. It'll also be ways to discover all of the assets we have downtown. Like I mentioned, we have a major university, but we also have a mountain in our downtown and we have a lake. So we have some unique features in the valley that we will um, include on our pass as well. So we've been really excited about the launch. Like I said, we launched last Tuesday. Um, you see this little character in the middle there. We found this old viewfinder that's at our lake and we turned him into a character and named it Ted for Tempe Explore and Discover. Put little googly eyes on him and we then put him around different parts um, of our city, different places, different merchants, had him engaging seeing all the things, doing all the things. And we were super excited about it. And after four days of posting that in our social media, it kind of felt like a hot potato. We didn't get a lot of engagement. So in the last 48 hours, we switched a little bit. We said, okay, Ted, we'll put you on the back shelf for now. And we kept up with the googly eyes and smiley faces. And we're personifying a lot of our assets downtown. So you see on the bottom row, we put some faces on cacti and some of our iconic buildings downtown. We have an old flour mill and silo. And that silo that you see, we posted yesterday. And we've had um, the engagement was off the wall. We had over 400 engagements within the first um, couple of hours of that post. And people were like, oh my gosh, I'll never look at the flour mill again. And so people are really thinking that it's a fun um, way to show off the city. and converse and likewise our um, signups for our pass also increased yesterday afternoon so we're very pleased with that for our future plans we are hoping to um, create a revenue stream with our pass we have um, provided a proposal to our regional transit authority we're about to launch a streetcar in our downtown next next spring and so we're going to white label a uh, version of the past just for streetcar riders. Uh, we are also engaging Arizona State University for things like family weekend and homecoming where they'll do like a takeover of the past and we'll switch out some of the um, graphics and maybe put some display ads in the past for all the families and alumni that will be visiting this fall. And then we also do some events like we have an A Mountain Challenge. We have a big mountain in our downtown where people climb up it and we reward them with um, prizes for getting out and exploring the city. And so we'll probably turn our A Mountain Challenge into a check-in pass as well. So we're super excited about all of the potential uh, with the Bend Wango Pass. And it's, like I said, it's been seven days and we are um, super stoked so far about the reception of the pass. So in summary, I think this is going to be another tactic to keep our city fun. And um, we hope that, um, our stakeholders enjoy it. Thank you. Awesome, thanks for that great overview, Lori. Um, I know a lot of people are probably joining or have kind of a college in their town. Do you have any advice about how you worked with ASU or how you're planning to work with ASU to promote this passport to students? Cause that's a really interesting kind of engaging idea. Yeah, we've for several years, I mean, there's, so many students in our downtown. Um, we're a bar district. And so there's a lot of students that come to drink. The university doesn't necessarily care for that. So we've always been looking for a way to engage the younger students to bring them downtown and discover all of the things like the movies and the ice cream shops and the cool shops. 
And we think this pass is something that will help that. And we've met many times with the different departments within the university, student services, family services, residential services, and crafted um, this pass based on what their needs are. Um, for example, family weekend, they have um, obviously a big football game, a ton of families come into town and Friday night is like the night where the parents take the kids out for dinner. And so this is hopefully will be the pass that they will then distribute to all of their families and all of their students that are taking part in all of their family activities. And they'll utilize that pass to go out to dinner, to do some shopping and to dis, um, discover the downtown where their kids are going shopping um, or where they're going to school. It hasn't been easy. There's a lot of different departments to go through, but um, we've been at this for several years. And I think this year might be the ticket with the one Discover Pass that will be a solution for all of the different groups on campus. Cool, thanks so much. All right, we'll hear more from Lori later. For now, um, we're gonna pass the torch over to Katie, who's gonna tell us a little bit about how downtown Colorado Springs uses Van Wingo's technology. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Just making sure, okay. Um, again, I'm with downtown Colorado Springs and we initially launched our pass, our first pass, our primary pass, which is the Discover Downtown Savings Pass in September of 2020. Um, and since then we've had, obviously that was, you know, there was COVID and things like that, but um, so we had some flat months. We started off very strong with a thousand downloads in the first month because we did a really hard push um, on social media and paid advertising for that. And we also did some paid like um, print and radio ads as well. And then it kind of fell flat for a little bit. And that was just because other things took priority in our office. And so we were not promoting it as much and talking about it as much or encouraging our um, merchants to talk about it as much. And so totally take responsibility for that. Um, but since we've started, we launched in September a, um, a marketing campaign, a very, it's, it's a lot of money. And so <laughs> we had some funding from COVID that we were able to use towards the um, the relaunch of the, the pass. And we now have over 4,700 downloads. Um, and this is a free pass. So we have 85 different businesses on here. And we have categories such as um, eat, drink, play, stay, um, with, and then venues as well. So Colorado Springs, um, if you're not familiar, is really putting itself on the map. I mean, we've been on the map, but we are we are not the downtown if you've ever been here that we were before. And so we're really trying to invite people, um, locals especially, that's where we target this Discover Downtown Pass is to our locals to rediscover their downtown because we're geographically pretty spread out um, in the city. And so trying to get people from where I personally live in, in a neighborhood called Briargate that's 15 miles away from downtown, they don't want to leave their little bubble. And so we really want them to rediscover downtown and see we have the Olympic Museum, we have a brand new downtown stadium. We uh, This weekend, we're opening a brand new hockey stadium. There's all kinds of really great things to do downtown. And so um, this was just one of the ways that we wanted to get people to rediscover their downtown and then also support our local businesses, which 90% um, of our businesses downtown are locally owned. Um, so during COVID, we use this mostly as um, a way to help get uh, foot traffic into stores. And when people couldn't go into stores, we created an online shopping portal for them to use where they could still use the pass and do curbside delivery. Um, oh, let me, okay, so I'm skipping to Popsicle Promenade. So we also have... <laughs> I didn't remember the order of my slides. So the Discover Downtown Pass is our primary pass and it's a free pass and it's a year long. We'll continue that probably for months to come, years to come um, and have our, our uh, merchants update at the holidays kind of just to refresh every once in a while. But we recently did a one day event pass uh, called the Popsicle Promenade. And that was on first Friday, September 3rd. It was a one day event. This was a paid gamified pass, it cost $10. And for that $10, you could go to a dozen different galleries and boutiques, check in and get a free treat. Um, and they use this, we've had this event for numerous, I think we've had it for, like, this is the fourth or fifth year that we've done the promenade. It was an established event that's always sold out. 
Um, so we knew it was going to be a successful event, but we'd always done it with a paper passport. We'd never done digital. So that was kind of a, um, it was that we were myself. I was a little bit worried, but it, I mean, Van Wango was there for us. I mean, they were so supportive and it went off without a hitch and we had great redemption rates. So, um, the lessons learned in that were that we need to be better. I need to be better about who we're going to have participate. Um, because for an art gallery, we need to, they were going in and getting their treat and then they weren't looking at the art or buying anything. And so it would be a little bit more, um, I think it would be better for the businesses if there were like, like a QR code on a piece of art that they had to go and find um, to make it more of like a scavenger hunt. So they would interact more in the store. Um, but overall, it was a great event. And our next, this is supposed to launch, fingers crossed, on Thursday. Our next pass is the Culinary Insider. Uh, it will run 30 days. And here we um, celebrate Arts Month in October. So it's uh, our way of celebrating the culinary arts. It will be a paid gamified pass um, and it will cost $10. That $10, we're not using this as a revenue stream, will be donated to students um, entering the culinary industry. And they will check in at up to 20 locations, uh, restaurants, and get menu items that you can't find on the regular menu. So that could be something like it's a throwback to we used to have this, your favorite sandwich. We're bringing it back. You only get it if you have this pass or a special drink or a special dessert that you won't find on the regular menu. And you unlock that deal when you have this pass. Um, so, again, that's kind of our slow season for our restaurants is. Um, when we start to get, it's the opposite of, of Tempe, <laughs> when we start to get cold and patio season goes away. So we're trying to um, support them through the slow season and also to promote oh, arts month. Um, let me look at my notes real quick because I had some other things you wanted me to answer. Um, you had asked how our merchants responded to the idea of the passport. And as with most of our, our, our marketing efforts, we have a group of merchants that are always excited to get, engage with us. But there's also that, those that choose not to participate, either due to the fact that they're overwhelmed by labor shortages or COVID issues. Um, and some of them feel like they just don't have time to take on another project. So we really take it upon ourselves to communicate with them about how easy it has become um, to it's it's really not very hard for them to sign up for the passport. And if they don't want to, we definitely don't want that to be a burden for them. I mean, if, if they're really truly overwhelmed, but it's such a simple process um, to get them onboarded and to ch even change or update their pass. It's, it's, it's kind of been a learning curve, but they're all catching on. So that's been great. Um, what are you most excited to see if the passport has been in market for a few months? So our savings pass has been market for over a year. It's been great to see the redemptions, but an unexpected um, bonus, which is probably my favorite part, is that our email list has grown by 148%. Because when people opt into our marketing messages, I have permission to put them on my email subscription list. And so um, that's been amazing, not only for our emails, but I can use that for Facebook advertising as well. Um, I think I've answered all the questions on those. Emily, did you have anything you want me to go over further on those passes? No, I think that was a great overview. Thanks for sharing that, Katie. And I think that you made a really good point about being um, like cognizant of what's going to work best for your merchants. I think across the board, our clients have found that, you know, there are certain pass types that really lend themselves to certain uh, types of merchants. So, you know, like using pin numbers at a restaurant and making sure like the wait staff knows to put their tray down or what you mentioned about the art gallery and kind of finding a way to guide people to those art experiences that maybe they're not, um, you know, used to really seeing or um, checking out in the gallery. So I think that was a really good point of kind of aligning the type of passport to the merchants that you have included and something that kind of Lori alluded to as well. So that was an excellent point. All right, thank you so much for sharing your experience, Katie, and we'll ask you some more questions later. Um, now we're gonna tee up Colin um, to talk a little bit about his passport. All right, thanks so much, Emily. Great to be here again, um, and good to hear what Lori and Katie have going on, lots of cool ideas there. Um, so again, I'm with the Longmont Downtown Development Authority in Longmont, Colorado, and um, we have a, a stop, shop, and stroll pass that is currently active through the end of the month here. Um, 
basically the genesis for that was we our organization does a lot to support um, our local small business and and work with our business owners obviously for collaborative ideas and we have a retail committee that meets um, quarterly and they've had a scavenger hunt idea for several years we've tried to implement different versions with minimal success um, just doing it ourselves and so enter bandwango to make things a lot easier um, we're relatively new to bandwango our dmo visit longmont um, uses bandwango for their craft beverage pass with lots of success and they had mentioned kind of the various capabilities that bandwango has so we hopped on a, an exploration call with the team and just talked about um, options and then ended up just go ahead, going ahead and planning this uh, this pass. So uh, it's been really great. It's very easy to um, implement. Uh, I kind of echo what Katie said. It's been really great to work with Bandwango. There's, there's a super ta talented and supportive staff, um, minimal work required for our, our organization, but also for the merchants. That was one thing that the merchants continually comment on is uh, they don't want to have to teach their staff a bunch of stuff or, or learn a bunch of stuff themselves or so this is a really, um, really easy way to make it easy for merchants to participate um, and yeah, and, and be successful. So um, we structured it as a check-in challenge, um, similar to, I think, what Lori had said. Um, and yeah, we weren't sure about, you know, requiring people to have offers for a savings pass, but I wanted to make that optional. So we did make that an option for businesses to include offers. Um, after they check in. And I think about 75% of them went ahead and did that, so they found that to be valuable. Um, and for kind of our goals and our structure, um, our target markets were, um, we wanted to kind of target downtown regulars. We have a lot of, um, you know, anchors that people visit often, um, but may not, go, you know, they may drive down, park, go into that store, and then leave. And so we wanted to kind of, um, target some of those folks to maybe kind of spend some extra time downtown uh, exploring, find a new shop, etc. Um, also, you know, Longmont residents who may not visit downtown very often, live on the outskirts, or just don't come to downtown for whatever reason, kind of give them a reason to, to come spend a few days downtown and exploring. And then also, obviously, um, visitors, since this is a partnership with Visit Longmont, they've been a really great partner to help promote this and, um, and yeah, give, give people who are coming to Longmont to visit uh, a reason to to cruise around downtown and explore. So um, we, as part of the check-in challenge, we, um, we, we wanted it to just be time limited. Um, September is kind of a slow month for our retail businesses, kind of after summer school has started and before the holiday season. So they all thought this was a good time. Um, so we just limited it to September 1st or 30th to kind of create some urgency and encourage foot traffic during that slower month. Um, we decided to choose winners who, from everyone who checks in at all of the locations um, more on that a little bit later. We were going to offer um, five hundred dollar downtown gift cards um, to, to you know we'll choose five winners from those who check in at all the locations, um, and then we also decided to choose weekly winners who had checked in at one or more locations. Um, a twenty five dollar gift card just to kind of incentivize people to just take the first step, sign up, download the pass, etc. Um, so yeah, just overall the goal was kind of incentivize people to come explore, stroll downtown, um, and and explore businesses and um, see places that they haven't been to, hopefully. Um, we, let's see. My slide's not working here. Oh, there it is. Sorry. All right, you see merchant visitor slots? Okay, cool. So um, I guess with our merchants, they were super um, excited, you know, when we've done this in the past, we've had like like Katie's kind of that core group of businesses that are always down to participate in anything, and then the rest are usually pretty skeptical or say it's too much work or too much hassle. But um, we have probably double the amount of uh, buy-in that we would normally have from businesses. Um, we had about 24 that were originally um, interested in participating, um, which was great for for our downtown. And um, yeah, a lot of them commented that they really liked kind of the ease of use for both on their side, the merchant end, and also on the um, on the customer side, and kind of how professional and streamlined the, uh, the user interface looked. So, so that was great, and that really helped to get um, get more merchants on board. Um, and then also for you know visitor, visitors and customers, um, we did have a good initial uh, response. I think we had close to 100 in the first week or two, um, which was great. Um, this was kind of um, a trial run for us. We just wanted to kind of get this going and see how it went. And 
So we're really, really excited to kind of hit marketing harder, maybe convert this to um, a long-term savings pass or something like that after it's it's done with. Um, but yeah, we're, we're happy with happy with how it went so far. Um, and just, again, heard from some customers. It was very easy to use. It was very straightforward. No real issues with, um, with anything technical or, or confusing. So that was great. Um, and then the feedback we heard back that I, that I mentioned is um, that it was too many required check-ins. And so that'll kind of take us to the takeaways and feedback. So, um, you know, obviously great buy-in from the businesses, um, really easy to implement and execute, but with the too many required check-ins, I think that probably hindered the amount of people that actually uh, took to the streets and were, you know, t actively checking in at places. Um, 22 is a lot uh, to check into. And so um, I think in the future, we will do something that's a little bit more um, accessible, maybe do some kind of tiered approach. Um, we've only had one person um, to date who checked in at all the locations. So i uh, still got a couple days left. We may, uh, we may see a couple more, but, um, but yeah, that was, that was something that was probably our biggest takeaway. Um, and then in the future, yeah, really excited to hopefully implement some more passes with Bandwango. Um, you know, at some point work on some sort of more permanent um, savings pass, maybe work with um, Visit Longmont to do something more citywide. Um, we also have a, a high concentration of not only craft beverage um, establishments, but uh, taco places. And so uh, we thought about doing a taco trail um, in the future, which would be kind of fun. Uh, we may look at doing that early next year. Um, we have a lot of public art and we could work with our art and public places um, commission to kind of kind of do a public art trail. We have lots of murals downtown. And then one thing that's interesting, we've had a really successful uh, winter passport program to incentivize people to shop locally and shop downtown during the holiday season. Um, but that's always been print based. And so, you know, obviously lots of people said, hey, could we you know, do something digital or do something hybrid? So um, that's something that we're really interested in exploring and seeing how we could um, how we can make that work with that micro. So, um, and then other things that we've worked with on the, that retail committee on um, some of our more successful um, self done promotions were like for Mother's Day one year for Mother's Day weekend, we did a, a mama needs chocolate. So we had different, um, you know, chocolate uh, candies at, at, I don't know, 10 or 12 different businesses and we gave out little heart shaped boxes. So um, you could go collect chocolates to give to mom um, while you're out shopping or dining or whatever. So, um, yeah, I might look at doing some other things like that um, in partnership with Ben Wink as well. So overall, been a really great experience for our first pass and looking forward to, uh, to doing more in the future. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. Thank you so much, Colin, for <laughs> giving us that overview of your wonderful passport. Um, I'm excited to uh, get into some questions now um, because I know a lot of the people who have joined us are maybe part of their own downtown organizations or maybe even DMOs that are looking for better ways to partner with their downtown organizations. So for those of you who are joining us late, um, feel free to ask your own questions in the chat box or the Q&A box um, on the screen. We're happy to answer those questions and I have a few up my sleeve that um, hopefully, Lori, Katie, and Colin will have some interesting answers too. Um, again, if you're just joining us, um, Van Wango is a uh, digital technology platform that enables communities to connect to their local businesses. So we talked a lot about how um, Tempe, Longmont, and Colorado Springs have done that. Um, so now I'm going to ask, you know, you guys, what is something or a piece of advice you would give to someone just starting their Van Wingo passports? What have you kind of learned along the way that you wish you would have known at the very beginning of your past launches? I would say just um, don't be afraid to take advantage of all the resources and support that Van Wingo offers. You know, we. Um, you know, on the marketing call, and and um, I had a couple questions about recommendations for how to set up the prize structure and things like that. And it was all super helpful advice that was super valuable. So I think that would be my advice: is take advantage of the resources that they offer. I 100% agree with that for sure. Um, and then also, I would add that uh, I could have done a better job, and I still am. It's we have so many businesses, but um, trying to communicate not just upfront but ongoing 
with because as staff turns over, you don't know if they understand how to redeem and it's really not working for you. You don't the pass isn't working at all if you're not redeeming because I don't know that people are using it. So just to stay in communication with the merchants um, and to support them um, in understanding how they can make changes and that it should shouldn't be like something that's stagnant um, that they continue to update and it's super easy to use. So that's all I would say. And I would mirror um, what Colin said about taking advantage of all of the things um, that Van Wango offers. We, I mean, you have a full suite of marketing collateral and at first it was like, oh, well, we'll have them do a poster. And then you made the poster and then you see all of the things that are available. And so it's like, heck, let's have Van Wango make everything for us because we don't know what we're gonna need uh, based on our target market and what we're gonna use it for. So we've had Van Wango design um, table tent cards and posters and a video and rack cards and business cards and almost every conceivable um, piece of marketing collateral, which um, we probably won't use all of them, but we certainly use them for inspiration to create some of our own. And so we take some of Van Wango's and some of ours to kind of personalize our collateral a little bit. So I, I would certainly take advantage of that. And, and I have to give a plug to the staff that it's um, super easy to work through the process of creating a pass. Um, there's definitely, um, you know, it's very clear on what needs to be done and when. And they were super helpful and were really friendly when they answered all my ridiculous questions. Well, one other thing I'll just quickly tag on um, to that is one thing I wish I had done better is um, communicating with the the merchants and empowering them to promote the past to their own networks because um, there's such good um, assets that Van Wango has for us and I think you know in the future for future passes um, we'll really try to hit that hard because we have our you know database and network and email list and Facebook followers and all that stuff but um, but spreading that out to the to the merchants is key for sure. Yeah, great responses, everyone. Um, and I'm sure our staff is going to be um, so tickled that they're beloved amongst our clients. Um, so we actually had two questions come in that are really good questions. One of them is, do you think paid passes hinder participation? And I'll answer from my perspective, and then anybody, you know, uh, Katie, Lauren, Lori, Colin, if you want to chime in. Uh, please feel free. But I actually did a webinar not too long ago, which is still available on vanwango.com called Size Doesn't Matter, How Paid Passes Can uh, Positively Impact Your Destination. And it's a really interesting take because I think the idea of charging a consumer to be part of a passport can can scare people. But as long as you've really got kind of a solid idea around what they're going to get out of it, what the benefit is. Um, Van Wango does a lot of paid passports that are focused on attraction tickets, admission, but we also do paid event passports. So Katie's Popsicle Promenade, they use a separate um, paid ticketing system for that and just use Van Wango as a support. But we have worked with destinations like Bryan College Station, um, Long Beach Peninsula to create paid ticketed events that have worked really well for them. And those destinations I just mentioned are fairly small, but they have had a great um, success using our platform um, in that way. So if you're still interested, feel free to email me afterwards. I'll put my email in the chat, but you can also find that really compelling webinar with kind of our, our client testimonials from those two smaller destinations who launched a paid passport that was really successful. So although it may uh, not be available to everyone, when a passport that's paid is configured in the right way, sometimes it can be a really great way to find those people who are highly qualified and ready to use it. Katie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that in our experience, it kind of, um, people show up when they've even paid $10, they're a little bit more invested in not losing their $10. So um, for us, it's been kind of a, a positive, um, as long as it's a low barrier to entry. I mean, I think if, depending on what your offer is, if your pass is $50 or $100, that might be a little bit harder, but $10 is not a whole lot and people don't want to waste their money. So We've had a good response with paid passes. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so another question that came in, and this one's really interesting too. 
How do each of you guys measure and communicate to your stakeholders the effectiveness and success of the passport? Um, you know, from a DMO or downtown association stakeholder perspective, and then also from a local business perspective. Um, I'll chime in from Van Wango's side. Van Wango's um, dashboard is updated in real time so that our clients can always see the number of redemptions, signups, check ins, purchases that, they're, um, that are coming through the system. And like Katie had mentioned briefly, you can also export um, those people who are opting in to receive additional communication. Um, our dashboard can be granted, um, uh, you can grant access to your different stakeholders, to your local businesses um, based on the views or reports that you want them to see, or you can just distribute that information to them directly. So that's from Van Wingo's side, kind of our standard answer, but can each of you kind of talk a little bit about how you communicated to your stakeholders how the Passport um, was doing? Yeah, I would, I would certainly just echo that. I mean, the, the, the back end dashboard that we have access to is, is uh, you know, very robust and, and allows you to filter. And um, it's it's been pretty much everything we have needed to you know, export and report back. So um, that's been great. And we use the dashboard to track redemptions um, and to track, um, you know, how how well the pass is doing. That It's a pretty robust um, system that they have that we can use. Um, so in my my reports to, we have a marketing and branding committee, and then we also have four different boards in our family of organizations that occasionally quarterly-ish, we uh, do marketing reports and statistics. And so that's always included as far as the growth of, of um, the pass holders. And then also I consider it really important, the growth of our email list, so. And I was just gonna say, we've had our, again, our pass out for one week. So tomorrow I will, communicate. My plan is to communicate with the participating merchants and um, share with them what our goals are and make sure that they're aware that they can be a part of that. Um, we created a marketing kit for them that we sent to them that contains links to a Dropbox that has photos and some of the marketing collateral and imagery, sample posts and all kinds of good stuff that they can utilize to then promote on through their channels that they are a participant in the discover path. So um, I'll be reminding them of that and um, it'll be a combination through, uh, we have a monthly merchant committee meeting and then um, an email will be the way that we'll communicate. Awesome, good answers all around. Um, I, so kind of follow up question to that. Um, you know, working with merchants, uh, downtown associations take great care of their merchants. What kind of advice do you guys have for other organizations hoping to make an impact with their local businesses? Um, I think for us, um, certainly listening to ideas, um, we, we never have a shortage of ideas. <laughs> we have a shortage of ability to implement them, but, um, but listening to their ideas and trying to see how how those can be implemented because um, they're the you know the boots on the ground and, and they see people coming in and, and they you know a lot of times know more than we do uh, what people would like and what people need and then also um, you know just with something like this it was really helpful for me we 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 sent out an email um, that Van Wango crafted for us um, to get initial participation. Um, in the past, but then we had, you know, when we were about ready to launch, we had, we went in, stopped in personally and had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, just kind of walked them through everything. And, um, you know, that's super valuable, especially for those who aren't the usual suspects who come to all the meetings and, um, and do all that. I think that was a, a really nice touch point. And we're hoping that, you know, this can kind of be a springboard for, um, for them having a little bit more participation in, in future things. So we communicate um, with our local businesses, if I'm understanding the correct the question correctly, um, through a private Facebook group just for our street level businesses, through monthly merchant meetings, and then through our merchant e-newsletter. And we try to reward those with the most redemptions by highlighting them in our general e-news, which is almost 7,000 subscribers, just kind of giving them a little bit of extra free marketing and saying, here's our featured business of the month and they're, they're doing well. 
we don't say that they're doing great, but that's why we're putting them in the newsletter because they're doing great at promoting the pass. But I loved, somebody had an idea of a retail committee. I think I need one of those. So thanks for that idea. Katie, I like that idea because we have, um, when we select, I sent an invitation out to about 50 different merchants because in the beginning I wanted like at least 50 merchants participating. And I'm glad it didn't work out that way because that would have been a lot. We launched with actually 28 merchants and two attractions. But um, those that are participating, I mean, in the last week, they've gotten a lot of extra coverage in our social media channels, on our blogs, um, through our earned media as well. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, to be fair and equitable to everyone, but, you know, those that are participating are certainly getting a little extra push. And the plan moving forward, which is kind of bubbled up with a lot of merchants that are like, oh, gosh, I, OK, I want to be a part of that now. Can, can I get on there? And so our plan is to onboard anywhere between five to 10 merchants each month so that that then gives us the opportunity to go back to the current pass holders and say, oh, hey, come back downtown and check in. We've got these newbies and they have these great deals or this is going on. So and then as a result kind of like Katie said, reward those merchants with some extra promotion through our, you know, Discover Pass promotion. So I hope hopefully it works really well. That's the plan. <laughs> this is kind of a rabbit trail, but I like what you really just said about onboarding slowly because Emily probably knows and Tessa's listening too, <laughs> that we I just wanted all of them all at the same time. So I tried to onboard like 150 businesses and I was getting so frustrated when they weren't responding to me. So I think that's a much smarter strategy to just do, you know, start with whatever is smart for you um, and just kind of incrementally ramp that up. Yeah. And I think that's a great point because we here at Banwango, you know, we work with so many clients and it's really a good problem to have that there are so many organizations we work with who <clears throat> want to take really good care of their merchants and include everyone. And we always tell people like we start with the list of 200 merchants max, but the way that it typically works is that when you do launch a passport with those people who are highly engaged, great ambassadors for you, the rest kind of trickle in. And I think Colin alluded to it a little bit too, which is that there are people who are always going to be your most highly engaged participants or merchants, but this is really kind of an opportunity to show them also like, we're going to take good care of you and have them be the ambassadors for that second, third, fourth round of new merchants that uh, get onboarded who maybe aren't as engaged. Um, it's a really good kind of conversation starter for people who may not know that much about your organization or who haven't participated in the past. So this kind of bleeds into the a question we got via the chat, which is what's a good number of check-ins? And the answer to that is really kind of dependent on how many merchants are included in the passport. So, and the timeline. So like Colin said, you know, a month maybe uh, felt like too short a time for people to do 22 check-ins. But we here at Banwango usually try to base the check-in threshold on the number of participating businesses. So for instance, if a passport has 15 craft breweries and it will usually say you know what seven check-ins might be a really good um, starting point or if maybe all of those businesses are spread out into different regions and people are really having to drive around for instance when we work with our state organizations occasionally they'll choose a lower threshold because they realize you know a lot of these people are probably going to go to a particular neighborhood and maybe they'll do everything there. How can we make sure that we keep them engaged? So maybe there are 10 state parks that are included in this one region. Let's make the check-in threshold 12 so that we know those people who are going to the 10, wonderful, we're also going to push them to do maybe two more that they wouldn't have gone to ordinarily. So there's usually some strategy in choosing that number of check-ins based on the proximity that your um, venues have to each other, your own personal goals for the passport, and also um, the number of venues that are included. So there's uh, not a cut and dry answer to that. There's kind of some math that goes into it on our end and then working with our clients to kind of figure out what that sweet spot is for them. 
Um, and then we also had another good question. So for paid passes, do you require a participation fee from the merchants? For paid passports here at Van Wango, we typically request from merchants like a wholesale rate for the good. And that is the fee to be part of the passport. So there usually is some kind of wholesale versus retail rate that we negotiate with the merchants as we onboard them. But for free passes, I'm interested to know from you guys, um, how did you work with maybe your membership and your downtown association or did you charge people or are you thinking about having any kind of like revenue generation to be part of the passport be um, part of your programs in the future? So for us, we don't charge our merchants. Um, we've gotten funding from um, our DDA and our bid to support the Bandwango um, process. And then, but I do know that Visit COS, which is another one of your clients, it's our local CBB. They do, if you're not a member of the CBB, um, one of their partners, they do charge, I think it's for each pass, I think it's different, but they did a crafts and drafts pass. And I think that was like $100 per participant to kind of recoup some of the cost of the platform to them. Um, and if they were non partners, then I'm sorry, if they were non partners, they paid. And if they were partners, they did not pay. But we don't charge. Um, we did not charge on ours. We're just thinking of it as more as one of the things that we're doing to help recovery from the pandemic. Um, not to say that we won't do that in the future. Um, you know, we do have some ideas moving forward for some paid passes and ways to incorporate the pass into a lot of the events that we do. So there's always the opportunity, but for now we're just going with a freebie. Yeah, kind of same as Lori, we, we just wanted to provide some support to our businesses and, um, you know, provide that as easily as possible for them, especially for this first one, you know, um, things that went well, it was pretty smooth. I think there's certainly opportunity to uh, look at different models in the future. We've also talked about, um, you know, like Katie said, having a little bit of skin in the game helps your, you know, your buy-in and your, your, your want, your desire for it to, to work well um, overall. So. Um, yeah, we certainly looked at, you know, if, you know, if a business pays in, you know, a nominal amount to be whatever part of these marketing promotions, then maybe we'd offer them, you know, a paid pass or something like that, but no, no uh, set plans yet. Cool. Thanks guys. All right. Um, so we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, what do each of you hope the future looks like for your organization? So five years from now, what do you have hoped to accomplish or what do you hope the kind of landscape for your downtown association looks like in the future? Well, I can, I hope in five years that we have um, moved through this period of um, uncertainty with recovery in terms of the production of, of events. Um, we, as an organization, produce a lot of events and then we have a lot of events come to our downtown. So I hope that returns. Um, I hope that office dwellers, office workers, come back to downtown in a substantial way, whether it's you know a hybrid model or whatever that looks like, uh, because so many of our businesses depend on that lunch business and it's pretty scary right now Monday through Thursday during the day so I hope that that recovers in some sort of new form and um, I really hope that people get back to coming downtown as a gathering space and a place to discover new things and meet people and just socially interact. And I hope that our organization is key in creating those experiences that, you know, invite people downtown. I echo that. I think those are all really good points. And then also just helping to spread the message about how important your downtown is to your city as a whole. Um, just like the, ta the sales tax revenue that we generate downtown pays for potholes all, all across the city and fire and police. And um, so just understanding how important your downtown is and supporting those local businesses. 
Yeah, definitely echo both what Lori and Katie said. Um, also, just for us, for our organization um, and myself, <laughs> um, just operating more efficiently. Uh, uh, I think that's something we've struggled with over the past few years, especially with all the, the changes over the past 18 months, um, trying to get, get back to having um, solid systems in place. And, and Lego, uh, I think, can be a huge part of that in terms of um, streamlining those things and those um, efforts. And then um, just hopefully getting back to kind of some of the growth and progress that we saw um, the previous five years, you know, 2015 to 2019. Um, I don't think we were hit too hard. I think we were pretty lucky um, in terms of the amount of businesses we lost and everything. But um, yeah, there's certainly some additional vacancies. And like Lori said, that that daytime office worker crowd would be great to have back. Um, and I think, you know, Longmont has often been uh, quite siloed in terms of people just kind of feeling like they're they're on their own and they're going to they're going to do their own thing. And so I think one thing that was good from the past year and a half is just kind of seeing that unity amongst businesses and cooperation. And I'm hoping that we can see more of that moving forward and, and keep that growing. Um, so I think that would be good for our downtown as a whole. Awesome. Great answers by each of you. Um, so to kind of wrap up, um, I want each of you to kind of share where people can find you online so that if anybody is following your progress, they can find you on Facebook and Instagram. But then also, um, what is one other downtown association you like to follow for inspiration? Give everybody kind of an idea of where they can find some of your favorite ideas and, and colleagues that you like to um, creep on in order to get your next big idea. I like Tempe. <laughs> I think your website's phenomenal. Um, and I also like Nashville. I think they do a really good job because they're such a big um, tourist town of itineraries and trip ideas and just getting people to uh, engage with the local like music scene, food scene. I think they do a great job. So uh, you can find us at downtownlongmont.com. Uh, we're also on you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Downtown Longmont. Um, yeah, obviously Tempe and Colorado Springs, go check them out. Um, but also um, we work closely with Fort Collins. We've got a really good relationship with them and I think they do a really nice job. Um, Downtown Boulders, um, you know, Instagram is very nice and vibrant. I think they do a really good job of their, um, their marketing efforts. Um, and then we recently redid our website and downtown Atlanta um, was actually one that we kind of based our website on. We really liked the, the layout of their website. So that's one that pops, pops in that we don't actually work with, but uh, it's good to check out. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and we uh, downtown Tempe can be found at downtowntempe.com and our pass is discover.downtowntempe.com uh, and we're downtown Tempe in all of the social channels. Um, brand new to TikTok, so that's a new one for us. Um, but I, um, in addition um, to Colorado Springs and, and now Longmont, I'm going to start following you guys because I like how your past looks. And um, I like uh, Cherry Creek North. I like Georgetown, D.C., um, Boulder. I'm a big fan of all the college towns, so I kind of see how you know they're engaging all their different stakeholders. So Boulder and Madison and you name it. I like them all. I mean, I, there's something that you learn from all the downtowns all the time. So I'm a, I'm a big stalker on other downtown social sites and websites. <laughs> and I forgot to mention, but I put in the chat where you can find us on social and on the web. Awesome. Thank you guys again so much for joining us. I feel like this has been such a illuminating conversation about how downtown associations work with local merchants work with their destination and hopefully has given people ideas of how they can work with their own downtown associations or how they can start to engage their local merchants and some really compelling ideas like the ones you guys mentioned today. So thank you again so much for your time. I hope all of our attendees follow someone after this. And if you're looking for where you can follow Banwango, you can find us on banwango.com. Again, all of our past webinars are in that resources section if you're looking to point people in that direction. And a recording of this webinar will be sent via email to all of the attendees um, and registrants today. So um, hopefully you're all following us on Facebook and in, uh, and um, 
where else are we? Facebook, LinkedIn. <laughs> you think this is my job, I don't know. Um, but hopefully you're all following us there and um, tuning in to the next webinar in October. Again, thank you to our wonderful um, clients and participants in this webinar. Uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, great guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye.